What up, it's your boy Burner, man. Check me out on the Bootleg Kev podcast. About an hour worth of game. You don't want to miss it. Sure. Are we rolling? Yeah, roll. All right. We are here. Bootleg Kev podcast. My God. It's been a long time, man. I want to say the last time we did an interview was in 2017. What's that, like four years? It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, we've seen each other. We talk a lot, yeah. you know, but as far as like actually sitting down and having a conversation, it's been a long time, man. You did a whole season of Burner's Roundtable. Yeah. <laughs> I tried. I tried. I tried it out, man. You I tried it out. And it was great. It was good. You know, it was good. I actually really enjoyed it. I just, you know, you got to use your time like... As you know, best as you can. I don't know if that was well received. I'm glad you liked it. I'm gonna love to do it again. I love the Tommy Chong episode. Yeah, that was good. That was a good one. That was good, man. Nah, um, you know it's funny because I just was watching an interview with uh, Joe Rogan, one of his episodes, and he was saying like the guy on the show was trying to convince him to do NFTs, and Joe was like, "I don't have time for this shit. Like all yeah, the time I have, like has to be, you know, allocated wisely." Yeah, you know what I mean. You gotta pick. You gotta pick your projects. I mean, people have been getting at me about NFTs every day, and it's like every every day a new homie figures out what an NFT is and calls me with this master plan. It's kind of like the CBD joke. Like I got a, I got a great idea. Let's start a CBD company. Like everyone, everyone has a CBD company. Yeah, you know. So I I don't know about the NFT shit. I just don't understand it, and I don't want to do something for my audience that doesn't make sense. If I can make it make sense for me, mm-hmm. like up here, then I'll do it. But I just don't understand it, bro. Well, you know what I think you do a great job of that I don't do a good job of, and that's like you have so much shit going on, so many companies, you got your music, but I always feel like you do a great job of balancing family and work. You got to. How did you figure, like, that's not an easy thing to figure out how to do. Like, how did you, how do you do that so well? Well, I just know that, like, at the end of the day, our kids only know what we teach them, and, you know, like, I just... I really love my kids. I love the family. And I just try to, that's like actually the balance I need to keep going because as spread thin as I am, bro, like I'll, I'll burn out sooner or later. So like, it's good to like be able to just turn the phone off and just focus on family and people respect it now in my circle. When I'm with the kids or when I'm with the fam, they just know that's the balance I need to, to keep working like this. It's tough to work like this, bro. Super, super draining. Nah, dude, especially like however you figured out how to keep everything going while also kind of being off the map during covid because for people who don't know you was kind of you was duck ducked off up north Ghost. du- ghosted during covid but yet you were still making shit happen like there were still grand openings happening and you know of uh, cookie stores all over the country like music we did new music we you know kept the clothing rocking i think that at the end of the day like covid was a big test mentally for people to see like can you keep it cracking you know what i mean can you keep your sanity can you and it's tough, man. Like, we took the precautions before we sat down, you know, and that's the way I'm yeah. moving now. Like, I got eight tests in my backpack. You know, each test kit got two. If I see someone, they got to take a test. I think it's just the best, most responsible thing to do. Whether it's accurate or not, it's a good peace of mind because we can't treat people like germs, man. It's just, like, it's getting weird. So, for me, that's been the best. Like, now that the tests are more available at Walgreens and whatnot, I've been able to move around a little more. Um, but, yeah, COVID was rough, bro. And I just bought a house in the cuts and just chilled out for as long as I could and I think that like it really like let people understand life is precious and you got to pick your circles. You know what I mean? Yeah, you've been extremely cautious with with uh, with the COVID shit. A lot more cautious than some of your counterparts, maybe in, in yeah. the hip hop game, right? Like, what what what's the motivation behind that? I mean, my uncles died from it, two of them, and like you know, I look at my texts every other day to remind myself, you know, he was just fine, like me and you were, and then was like, I'm going to the hospital, and then from the hospital, it's like, yo, they're gonna put me on this machine and die, and so it's like, it happens. Like that, you know what I mean? And so I've seen a lot of people struggle for it. And I think that people that lost people to COVID, it hits a little harder. It hits home. Yeah, my grandma died, man. Exactly. Yeah. And so, like, you know, I've just been, bro, I've always been paranoid, though, bro. That's why, you know, I'm always worried. That's why I've never been, you know, never been to jail. I never, I've always moved a certain way. And I think that's what got me where I'm at, bro, is just being cautious. But at the same time, like, understanding you still got to move. You know what I mean? So just move right. Yeah, that's real. I think, uh, it's it's been a weird like unfortunately like covid i feel like also is originally i felt like it was politics that was dividing people and that kind of leaked into covid dividing people i believe covid's a way bigger agenda than what what we see it as right now it's it's a very big agenda to 
in my opinion, and we, we won't dive into it too deep, but I feel like it's a attack on, you know, us as, as a civilization, but also like us as America too. I think they're trying to cripple our fucking our economy and just us as people. You have to understand COVID's more of a mental thing than it is anything. It's really like when you get COVID, you're by yourself. You have to isolate. You have to social. It's like just fucking with your head hella much. And the way I look at it now, it's like, all right, look, my kids are back in school. I'll take the risk for that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Let them go back to school. Let them enjoy their life. Let them chill with their friends. Let them play sports. If I'm going to get this shit, I'm going to get it from the house. But I'll take the precautions when I'm out and about. For sure. Got to, man. Let's go back, Burn. Like, um, you know, for people who don't know, where did you start at when it comes to making music and getting into the weed game from the jump? Yeah, and I mean, music, I've always been a fan of music, and that's why I still make it. I don't make music because it makes me proud, or I don't think I'm the best musician. I'm a fan of it. I love to put records together. So I started off musically by battle rapping in Frisco um, at this coffee shop on Hayes Street. Just go there and battle rap cats and had fun with it and used to battle rap hella people and just, I mean, I don't even think a lot of people know that, but that's how I started fucking with it. And then from there, um, just met some cool producers and, you know, I had an A track at the time. I was making music in my garage in Arizona. Um, I told the story before a couple of times, but I was in a continuation school in Arizona. A kid approached me and he was kind of like, this is where I first started before going to Frisco. Um, he tried to convince me. He's like, yo, you look like a rapper. You'd probably be a dope rapper. I spit some. I'm like, spit what? Like, how do you, how do you do it? Right. He like spit a little freestyle, got me to do it. It was whack. It's like, man, I think you should buy my equipment. You should buy my little A track or it was a four track or whatever it was at the time. Right. It was like, not even that, actually. It was like a karaoke setup type thing. He's like, you can record music. You put the beat. You rap on the mic. You can make your own shit. I'm like, really? So I went and asked my mom for the money. She was kind of against it, but gave it to me. It was like 200 300 bucks or something. I bought it off him, and I remember watching him go back to his friends that he upgraded to a four-track or eight-track. So I was like, ah, motherfucker kind of played me. But I started playing with it. So start started out just fucking around the garage in Arizona, 110-degree 100, fucking garage. Serious heat. And I told my mom, I was like, look, if I ever want to take this music shit seriously, I got to get back to the Bay. We should move back to the Bay Area because where we're from, that's where all the independent music game is. That's mm-hmm. where JT was doing his thing. Gotos was doing his thing. Jive's there. Everyone yeah. was there. I just seen like, you know, E-40. I was like, I'm never going to make music here in Arizona. I think my mom was supportive. I was like, let's, let's go move back to the Bay then. Fuck. So your mom actually made the decision to move back to the Bay based on you wanting to pursue music. Yeah. That's huge. That's that's a big gamble on her part as, sure. as an adult. Because I mean, she changed everything. She changed like her work path, like everything she was doing. She just switched up for that, which is dope as fuck. What year did your mom pass? Um, 2010. So she kind of got to see like the beginning of this starting to really work out. Yeah, she started like right like um she saw up until like um she saw weekend at Bernie's. She saw like shit like that, and then I think like. She didn't see the uh, she, she didn't see Yoko she saw the white album. No, she didn't see Yoko or none of that stuff. No, but she at least she saw that there was like she saw that's it. dope, man. She used to teach workout classes to my shit. Wow, you know water aerobics classes to my shit. And you know my shit ain't nothing. Teach no fucking aerobics. Right, 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 right. Hilarious, actually. That's that's funny. And then what about like you know the weed shit? Obviously, you know you you, you talk about it in your raps all the time. And and but but when did you kind of start to become like serious when it came to just the weed shit because obviously it all starts from a place where it's trapping and then I it just evolves fell in love with weed and i was like i gotta do this you know no matter what it is from doing what i was doing when i was younger to getting into the dispensary stuff to you know when i was just working at a dispensary you were doing security at a dispensary or something right no nah, I, I got hired as like a kind of like an intake person like People show up, I check their doctor letter and make sure it's official, call the doctor, check, buzz them into the, the main area where they go buy the weed, and then move me into, like, we actually, like, sell the weed. I was a bud tender, and then went from there to a buyer, and that's when I really fell in love with the shit, talking to all the vendors and the growers and seeing different strains and whatnot, then to a manager running the shop. And it's funny because people would come in, fans of the music, and couldn't believe I just worked there. They thought I owned it. And so, so the, people would be fucking with your music, come to the dispensary, and then they see you, and they'd be like, "Oh, this is a burner spot." But you were just that was my shop. I just was fucking working there because I loved it. And as my music career got bigger and bigger, I had to commit less and less time to working there, and eventually just figured out I had to do my own thing, you know. So, yeah, because like with cookies, like I remember, like I remember, like the first time I, me and you met was it was in two thousand and 
13 at South by, but before that, it might have, we might have met before that in Phoenix. I don't know if that was before or after you and Chevy did that little tour run. Mm, Buds and says to her. Yeah. yeah. But I remember there was like a world star video of you and some like Asian chick yeah. where you were having her do interesting things with See, smoke. A, lo- a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people don't know why I did that. Like, I'm not proud of that shit. And I always joke about that shit's going to come back and homie. Shout out to Suki. Um, and there was one before her too, but like, so we're the first ones to ever put a hash pen in front of the world. Like no one's ever seen what everyone uses now. The vape pens. Yeah. I was the first, we're the first crew to ever show that off. Like my, my guys invented that shit, right? It was before anyone's seen it. And, um, I was trying to figure out a way to get equity in the company. I'm like, yo, this shit's about to be a game shit. This is fucking 2090 shit. Be like, hit a fucking hash and a pen. What the fuck? Yeah. And so, um, they didn't really understand the reach I had, and I knew the internet and and promotion or whatever. And it's a world like, star era too. Yeah, and so this is when world star was cracking. And so they're like, "Look, if you can get us an amazing around uh, amount of promotion, you know, we we consider bringing you as a partner." I'm like, "All right." So I just thought Stoner Girls Gone Wild, and I just did it, and it hit like millions of views the same day. And I was like, "Is this good enough?" And they were so fucking mad. They're like, "Dude, what the fuck would you do that for?" But everyone wanted the pen after that. So you know. They're like, well, you did that once, you can't pull it off again. I'm like, shit, I'm as, I already got an idea. And I met Suki in the strip club, and I was like, yo, you want to be famous? And she was like, how? I'm like, shit, it'd probably be better if I just holler at you outside of here. And I yeah. hollered at her, and I was like, look, you're going to smoke this pen with your ass. And she's like, you're fucking nuts. I was like, I bet you it goes viral, and I bet you it, shit goes crazy. And she's like... We were, I remember, I'll never forget we're at lunch and uh, she asked the waitress, like, ma'am, ma'am, if I smoke this pen with my ass on camera, does that make me a whore? And she's like, a whore? No, but it's pretty fucking weird. She's like, weird I can deal with. Let's do it. <laughs> so, you know, shit, shout out to Suki. That shit went platinum. Drake DM me because of that. Wow. Drake shot me a DM like, yo, you're a wild man. You know, pull up to me at the model video. I'm in the bay. I'm like, damn, that fool seen that shit. So it is what it is, man. That shit did what it did, you know? Yo, like, the backstory behind cookies because cookies has become i mean weed aside i feel like it's the best seller at zoomies it's got to i mean every time i go to zoomies it's i mean front of the window all over the country the, the the clothing line itself has just became its own monster man like it's 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 dope as fuck because i never thought it would last this long you see clothing lines kind of like rise and dip yeah always we ain't dip bro we're still going i think there's so much more growth and i think the reason why it's popping is because clothes are dope the accessories are dope it's innovative it's it's fly it looks clean it's not too much like and like i did it the right way like i never like i watched clothing companies back in the days just send huge boxes to people and i never did that bro i never i had too much pride as an artist as well to Big other artists to promote my shit. I just let that shit ride off my fan base and my fan base and my supporters start blowing that shit up. And I still don't know how that shit is. What it is. Yeah, it used to be like I'd go to the airport and if I saw someone with a, some cookie shit on, I'd be like, oh, do you know, like, do you know Burn? Or like, you know, like, because it was a very small, like, niche type of community. But now everyone has cookies on. You know what's tied to me? Cookies outgrew me. People know who cookie, what cookies is and don't know me. And that's amazing. That's because so before it was the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, before they'd be like, oh, yeah, burn it. But people see people with cookies on, like, you know, burn, like, who? Oh, this is amazing. It, it worked. You know? What is, like, like give people, like, an idea of, uh, I've heard, some, I mean, I heard some numbers a couple of years ago, like, about how, how, how good y'all were doing on the clothing yeah. side. But, like, uh, give me an uh, idea on how good this thing is, is doing right now. Only because I love you. I always, if you look at any interview, I always say I'm not talking numbers. But, you know, at, at some point in time, like, you know, I see all the rappers online flexing with their, you know, their cash by their ear and shit. I don't do that shit, but I mean, I guess I'll flex today. I mean, Cookie's on path to like probably like, um, I think 50, 55 million this year, clothing. Just clothing. Just clothing, yeah. Last year we did 32 million clothing. <sighs> it feels great. Congrats, man. And, and, and the tight thing is, it's like, we just got started, bro. Like, we haven't even opened up flagship stores everywhere. We haven't really went to other countries yet. Like, we haven't really done what we're about to do. You know, there's the future forecast of Cookies Clothing, just the clothing, not the weed, just the clothing is pretty dope. Yeah, and I think, too, like, just some of the, like, collabs and, like, the licensing, like, when you guys do, like, the Scarface line or the, the Goodfellas line that just came out. Sick. Like, it's always on point. And some of the next ones we have coming are going to shock the fuck out of people. Like, some of the ones that we've locked down is incredible. Like, I... 
can't even believe we got it. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay, and then on the because you know I I do feel like you don't get a for whatever for whatever reason you don't get enough respect on a lot of fronts. Yeah, I as like a, it though. I like that shit as a rapper. Yeah, you're. I think you're the hardest working rap. I mean, I don't know people who have output like you. There's very few people. Maybe the Griselda guys who are putting out as much albums as you do every year. I have Forty plus albums out right now. I feel like it's three or four a year automatic. And I own the catalog, so it's like you know shit. It's right there. That's a whole nother animal too. You know what I mean? Like the rap money is good too. I don't even be flexing that shit, but the rap money is good too. Yeah, like everything goes away. If you just had your rap money, you'd be living nicely. Bro, I could honestly live and raise my family off the music. And that's the funny thing. It's be, oh, he's just a weed guy or he's just this cookie. That's cool. You can say all you want, but shit, the, the rap money is cool too. I mean, 20, uh, 20 joints is gold or platinum? Gold. Yeah. It's my only gold. Uh, well, that and. Uh, I think I'm on. That's the only song I have that went gold. I think El Chivo should be getting close, but that's uh, got to be close. Yeah, I never got a gold album though. That's my. That's like my bucket list. Before I die, I got to get a gold album. I mean, I feel like over time, one of your albums has got to get there eventually. Like, what? What? What is your biggest album? Mm. As far as like numbers wise, like I think, uh, I think the biggest album number wise is probably. Uh, it got to be like, um, I think Pax did really well. Pax is probably my favorite. Pax did really well. Um, dude, back in the days when you could sell physical CDs, the Below albums with Messy Marv did hella good too. Those are the days. Those shit went crazy, bro. Like, I was selling like 15,000 physicals, you know what I mean? Like, and then whatever the streaming side was. So, I don't know. I mean, I think that like, um, I like being an underground artist though, because you have to understand like, Mainstream artists, they get a song on the radio, and then as soon as they come off the radio, they say they fell off, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at my music career, if you're looking at business, it's only gone like this every year. Now, I've never shot up. Mm -hmm. I've never had a straight home run, right? But I've elevated every year. So if I get a record that hits, hits, I got 42 album catalog to back that up. So well, That's what I was going to ask you. You really don't have like a... And I don't know if anything's changed, but you don't really have like a manager per nah, se. I mean, right now, I don't have a manager. I don't even have a booking agent. I actually shout out to Bobby D, uh, Uncle Snoop's Army. He's been booking me. Yeah. Um, but I'm really just, I'm a sick fuck, Kev. I like to be hands on with everything, bro. I was going to say, because I feel like you've had records. I feel like you put a bag behind a record once. I think it was the Busy Body record. Or what nah. was the record that it, you put a bag behind a record? Was oh, it the yeah. one with, this was like mm -hmm. three or four years ago. And I got mad because it didn't work, huh? Which one? You was got that? mad, and I told you, bro, you hired the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was a busy body record, bro. But honestly. I feel like you've had records that, like, especially after that, like, records with A Boogie, records with G, records with, I mean, you've had some crazy records that. I mean, there's the one with 2 Chains, Wiz, Cameron, and fucking um, someone else that should have been, should have been out of here. Like, I just, should have been gone, bro, but. I mean, all in a day. Was, all in a day uh, should have been gone too. All in a day, I mean that's old, you know, but that's a lot older. But you know but what? I think that Latino artists don't really get the props they deserve, bro. It's a weird, it's a weird, like it's weird. It's really weird. Like it's hard to to break through, bro. But I don't even try to understand this shit no more. I prefer where I'm at. Like I see some of the mainstream artists and I look at some of the deals they're in and some of the things they have to deal with and they don't own their music. Like I'm happy where I'm at. I feel like you get to kind of do what makes you happy in the music industry without having to worry about all the shit that makes people hate this shit. Because no you're just because you're just doing you. There's no pressure. There's no pressure. You built your own world. Yeah, I'm good. I mean, we're down the street right now, knocking down some shit, bro. And the music sounds. It's probably the best body of work that I've ever created. And there's no pressure. I don't yeah, I mean, you know, you you always came through the clutch with some great collab projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my favorite collab album you've ever done is probably the one with Mozzie. Yeah, man. I think that's front to back. Uh, that's probably top three project of years for me. Yeah, because you know what, like the energy in there was like, it was like the best energy as far as like, like I I was vibing off him. He was vibing off me. Made me set my game up. But my beat selection is crazy, bro. Like I'm like an underground Cali when it comes to that. Ear. I was gonna say you got like, that Rick Ross ear low key. Yeah, I got I got that good ear low when it comes to them beats and putting artists on beats they usually don't rap to like. And that's why maybe I'm in the position I'm at because I'll get a big artist and put him on a sample beat instead of like trying to go big. But I don't mm -hmm. want to fucking go big. Like I don't want to be on the fucking radio, bro. Yeah. What What is uh like and you know there's been this 
project with Wiz that we've gotten teased over for years. Yeah. I think it was supposed to come out like two or three Christmases ago. <laughs> I think like six years ago. Yeah, it was seven, eight. I don't know, man. I know you guys probably got a ton of records in the cut no one's ever heard. Yeah, they're sitting there. You know, I just, when the time is right, he'll let me know. And, you know, if he wants to drop it, I'm down. And I think that, you know, like there's a lot more records to make. And, I mean, me and Wiz make great music, dude. Like, I have I have a really good ear for beats when it comes to him too. Like I feel like I pick really good records like with him. You know what I mean? Like I love and then we bring like a certain kind of energy out of each other. Like when I pull up on him in the studio, like he'll bust out a different style that he ain't really been using when it comes to stuff that we do. So I feel like when the Me and Wiz album happens, it's gonna be powerful because we've been sitting on it for so long. So you know when the time comes, I think people will be fired up. Who do you? Uh, is there any talks of you doing any collab albums with anybody else right now? Seems like we get one a year or so. Yeah, you know, me and Rose are supposed to do one, like a small EP, like probably like three to six songs. That's going to be fire. You know what I mean? Like, I can't wait for that. I've been actually saving, like, a lot of mental space for that. Like, if you notice this year, I dropped less albums this year than I ever had because yeah. I've been waiting for the Rose album. And then uh, me and Azuna are doing, like, a project. It's not a, it's not a group album. We'll ha probably have, like, two or three records together on there, powerful ones. But we're going to use like our both of our reach to put together like a sick ass project just kind of based around the brand we're building. So, you know, other artists from Latin America from here just create like a sick ass, like almost like a compilation, but more like a like maybe this will be like a annual project, like every other year or something like that. You and Ross. Uh, Ross is somebody who I feel like has also kind of laid the blueprint on how to be a successful entrepreneur. One of the easiest, best partners I've ever worked with. I mean, he's. One of the hardest working, smartest, easiest partners I've ever had, straight up. Yeah, because you've obviously collaborated with a lot of artists on the on that side of the game, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure sometimes it's a little bit, you know, things haven't worked out sometimes. And I'm well, sure, well, you know, some people are just scared to use their platform to promote the shit you're working on. Like Rose, he's getting on Instagram, he's pushing that shit. He's not playing. He's a businessman, and also he understands the long term play. You know, my advice to a lot of people out there, a lot of people are looking for that money right now. They want their money right now. What can I get right now? There's power in building equity. You know what I mean? Like, when I look at my equity and cookies alone, like the weed side, we talked about the clothing side. We look at the weed side. We're getting, we're going to get there for sure. Yeah. So I know what my equity is. I'm not, I only take a small salary from cookies to weed side. I get like a, a salary that's almost laughable when it's the type of shit I do, but the equity is there if I ever want to pull. So he understands that long-term play. And that's why me and Rose work so good together because he knows we're building something that's super long-term. Especially when we open up Cookies Florida, his brand's going to dominate out there because he's been such an easy guy to work with. And we take that in the back of our head. And we're like, cool, when we open up Florida, we're going to have 400,000 square feet of indoor cultivation. I'm going to put his shit in heavy rotation. We're probably going to make a store dedicated to his brand, Collins Ave, fully decked out with his logos everywhere like I just appreciate the hard work and, and the vision and the long term play because there is a big exit, you know. So. Yeah, let's let's get let's let's kind of tap in uh, to the weed shit a bit. Like I said, man, you are underappreciated, underrespected in this game. I always tell everybody, burner is richer than all of the rappers. Like you know, and I don't even I don't even try to think like that. But no, but I, I, I listen. I be having arguments with motherfuckers yeah. for you when you ain't around, and I be like, yo, like legit, and I'm not saying no names, but. I don't know anybody in hip hop outside of maybe fucking Dr. Dre or some shit. Maybe Diddy, you know, maybe, you know, the, the guys we think of, and these are more executives at this point, but mm -hmm. when we're talking like, I don't know anybody who's, who, who's fucking with you when it comes to net worth, buddy, at this point. Well, if you look at like cookies, clothing, cookies, cannabis, if you look at vibes, papers, vibes is on a crazy, crazy run, crazy traction. Like I, I get anxious thinking about that. And you think about like, equity and weed maps and you look at stuff like g pen and Santa cruz shredder and you know things that people forgot i have my hands in like there's a crazy ecosystem of very valuable companies and it's kind of spooky sometimes man i just you know shit. i heard I, listen to me I, I heard a rumor that you, that cookies was offered uh pretty much to get bought for like close to a billion dollars and you guys turned that down is that true yeah no we get crazy offers all the time someone was just sitting down with us recently trying to get us to go take our shit out on the Canadian Canadian, Canadian stock uh, market. market and whatnot. And the numbers they were talking about there, if we went out, like, it's crazy. And I just, like, the way I look at it is, like, that shit ain't real. I just keep my head down and keep trying to focus on, you know, how do we keep this shit running? I don't even think, because if you focus on the numbers too much, you'll get caught up in that. You'll get comfortable. I'm never comfortable. 
You know, we had we had this shit set up at noon. I was I text you hell early. Could we do it earlier? Yeah, you know what I mean, like, of course. Because I always work, bro. I, and I think I got that from my pops. You know, what I mean, like I just never really focus on. It. But to get to your point, yeah, the net worth is probably pretty pretty powerful right now, and I don't even know when or how that's going to happen. Knocking on a billion. Yeah, probably. I think so. I think so. I mean, I don't really know. I mean, I know cookies is. I know next time we raise money for cookies, it's going to be in the multiple billion. So just look at that like that. Well, I mean, it seems as if too, like anytime there's a new market that becomes legal, there's like three cookie stores that open in the state. Straight up. And then you got lemonade too. And I'm and le- about yeah. That. And lemonade is another yeah. brand that you're sister brand. Yeah. Sister brand. You don't brand. want to overwater every, you know, hella cookie stores, you know, cookies like Nike town almost. Right. But we came with the sister brand lemonade, which is killing it too. And, um, I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think about how much more growth there is. I mean, there's Latin America, there's Europe. And you and uh, Ozuna are doing something in Puerto Rico, right? Yeah. Puerto Rico, there's the East Coast. We ain't even hit the East Coast. Yet. Yo, I was telling, man, we were just talking about New York. Me and my boys like, yo, in New York, when the cookies hits New York, oh my God. It's about to go crazy. And I think the best thing about our company is that we have such a good team of breeders. Um, and we're menu planning out for... A hundred years, not right just right now. I got so much genetics in my hands right now from all the breeders that we have in house and the ones that we collaborate with. I kind of treat it like beets. I'll sit down with the breeder, we do a breeding project. I'm gonna pick A, B, C, D, F, G, right? Boom. I'll take these, I'll tuck them, just keep them, release a couple a year, whatever it is. But we have so much genetics that we're planning out for a hundred years. So, you know, we're doing a really cool shit right now where we'll film it and be like, yo, it's 2021, I'm sitting here. It's like a Mexican chocolate I did with Bodhi. Shout out to Bodhi Seeds. We're going to take this. I want to drop this in 2080. We're going to put this in tissue culture. This is the flavor profile. And if you work at Cookies right now and you, you want to know why we're dropping this, this is why I like it and this is why I want to name it. And we're going to drop it in 2080 and we take that footage and we put it away. So one day maybe it'll be a hologram or one day it'll be a video message. So Maybe an NFT. <laughs> something, right? But point being is I don't want to open up all these stores around the world and them have no purpose or no direction or no vision, right? Like, I thought it'd be cool that if we have hundreds of stores around the globe, right, when I'm dead and gone in the future, they see a video of, like, why we're releasing this strain, why he liked it, why he, why he named it what it is, and to give my, my employees and my team and whoever's running them stores fucking vision, bro, like, how these people fired up, like, picture if, you know, Colonel Sanders popped up and was like, yo. Hey, guys, yeah. You know, like, I think people at them drives who would take their shit a lot serious, you know, mm-hmm. a lot more serious. So we're planning out. And that's my main thing is like, I don't get caught up in the numbers of what cookies is doing. I'm getting caught up in how do I keep this shit sustainable for a long time? I want to be a hundred year brand. I don't want to be a brand that's right now. I want to be popping later. Um, as you know, we had a couple of interactions with a weirdo out in Arizona trying to make some stuff happen out there. Yeah. But I've, I've realized that in the weed game, there's a lot of fucking weirdos involved. It's a lot of emotions involved. And a lot of ego. A lot of ego, a lot of emotions, a lot of um, a lot of hate. I mean, people try to knock what I do. And I tell them like this. I work with hundreds of partners and operators. It's the hardest thing ever to do what we do. Yeah, because for people who don't know, like, not all cookie stores are the same, right? It's not yeah. like like you have to partner with, with people in different states. I picked a very states. strategic, unique model. Mm-hmm. I said like this. Look, and going back to raising money. The reason why we turned down that that 800 mil back in the days, well, it was mostly stock. There was a good upfront. Don't get me wrong. There was a lot of cash, but most of it was stock. But I decided to raise small, right? I raised 20 million bucks, and I'm still working off that same $20 million from that interview. And we stretched it and turned this shit into a fucking empire. Wow. Because we decided instead of going out and buying assets and building from the ground, that would take too long. Life short. Take a lot let's of money. Go, let's go ident- and take a lot of money, which means a lot of dilution. Mm-hmm. That's why my net worth is high because I kept my equity, right? Mm. So what we did si- decide to do was let's go around the world, let's go around the country and find operators that are killing it right now, right? With their stores that they have going right now or with their grows they have going right now. Let's do a partnership with them that's very rich in their favor for right now, right? And mm-hmm. keep the majority of the money coming in right now. But we get a roll-up option on their stores. We get a purchaser store in the future, right? We get a small rip on percentage, and we get to have creative control of their operations. So you empower a great grower in 
New Jersey. You give them their exit plan. You give them, you give, exactly, you provide them with exit plan, but you empower their knowledge and their skills. I would rather work with a bunch of talented people than have to build everything. From, it would take too long. Yeah, it take, it, it's, it's a lot. So our business model was find incredible operators from here to wherever we're going, empower them, give them our genetics, give them our SOPs, make sure we have a great team on the ground to oversee the operation and build, right? And it's worked fucking incredible. It's for people who don't know, it's 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 similar for for people who aren't really into into the weed game. Would you say it's similar to kind of like a franchise model? Nah, it's different. It's like a But you guys get to curate who gets that exclu- ex- because cherry pick. Like I'll go to I'll go to Massachusetts for example. You're not going to just let anyone nah, get the cookies brand. Nah, it would be over. It's quality control you involved. Go to, you go to a market and you find the best cultivator, the best operator and you go look at all of them and what they're doing before they even think about partnering with you and you you cherry pick the best and you form a partnership with them. You pick who's going to do it. So it's it's almost like a franchise idea but totally different. Except for you guys get to pick because you're not going to jeopardize I cannot. the brand. Because no, when we think of cookies, we think of uh, the, the best weed in the world. Yeah. Yeah, no, nah, it's it's really cool. So it's kind of like a franchise, but way different because no one could just come to us and say, hey, we got 100 grand. Let's let us get open. No, nah, it doesn't work like that. Anybody either. can open a Quiznos. You can't open the cookies. You guys have to. It's got to be a mutual choice. Yeah. Have you had an, a situation where... Uh, you had a partner and it just didn't end up working out, or maybe they ended up maybe fumbling, or um, that happens. That happens with everything. I think that we've done a really good job when finding partners, just like picking, because I've been in this for a long time. You, right, you identify me and you had a similar situation. We talked about it. You identified things right away, like oh, this ain't gonna work. Yep, this too trippy. We won't move forward with that. So I think that we've done a good job of like judging character, kind of like finding the best you know in class that we can find. So we haven't had too much problems, but. I think the biggest problem we have is like denying batches. You know what I mean? Like we have a very strong QC team right now. And it took a while to learn that. Like I would lie if I didn't say there was learning curves to expanding this fast, right? But what we've done is like in single markets, we'll say, hey, we're not we're not approving any of this. Like you can go package under something else. It's not coming out. It's under not coming bag. in our bag. Yeah, so it's hard. That's the only struggle is like we end up denying sometimes more than we accept. Mm. That's to, to protect the brand. You know I mean, you can't just put bullshit out. A hundred percent. What would be some advice? You know, because I, I got to imagine from your perspective, right? You're, you know, the one thing that I think makes you different than a lot of rappers who are trying to do the weed thing is like your genuine passion for the whole process and not for just, you know, if we think of a lot of these rappers, they're just trying to be you low key. They want, everybody wants their own cookies, but like you said earlier about Ross, a lot of guys just want money now. Yeah, they want to put. They want to say, "Hey, what, what's what's my money now looking like?" As opposed to trying to really build a brand. And I feel like so many rappers are just whoring their name out now in the in, in the weed space. It's like kind of crazy. And and even rappers that don't smoke, hmm. like a lot of rappers who do not smoke weed. And I, I'm not even talking about like shout out to Jay Z, not a big smoker, but Jay is a fucking boss. So I'd expect Jay to get into the cannabis game. But mm. there's a lot of rappers who are participating in the weed culture right now that really have never been in the weed culture. Is that kind of frustrating for you to kind of? I mean, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But is it? Is it no, I don't. I don't even take it a certain type of way. The way I look at it is like this: Why do I do this still? Right? It's emotional. It's crazy. A lot of drama is take, probably taking years off my life from stress, but. I do it because I love it. I, I know it's that weed really unites people. It brings people together from every different walks of life. Facts. Whether you're old, young, gay, straight, fucking, you know, whatever. I've seen weed unite people all around the world. That's why I do it, right? Two, I love weed. I'm obsessed with it. I've been doing it for so long. So I guess I say that, that to say I'm passionate about this shit. When you're passionate about something and you really live it and you walk it and you understand why you're doing it, I don't think you can even worry about no one else. So I welcome everyone getting in the game with open arms, but I think that they'll burn themselves out because they might not really be passionate about it. You go to my studio session right now, there's 42 jars laid on the table, all different names on them. I got a notepad next to those jars. I'm just smoking them, What's taking notes on what I like and why I like it and slowly putting them aside and picking which ones I'm going to keep, which ones I'm going to give away. And, it's a fucking process. I love this shit. I do this shit. I, well, I live, eat, and breathe this shit. So, you know, the people that are in the game that, that want to just get in to get in, I think they'll just burn themselves out. What would be some advice you would give someone watching this who is trying to get, I'm not even talking about rappers, just in general, trying to get into the legal side of the weed game? Start from the ground up like I did. Learn the business. Understand what you want to do and why you'll be impactful in that, in that space and 
work your way up. That that's what I did. I mean, I tell people all the time: if you want to get in the weed game, go work at a dispensary. Understand the consumer, understand the vendor, understand the grower, understand the bud tender, the, the POS system, yeah. understand the bud tender, understand how to merchandise, understand everything before you get in. Decide what you want to do. Do you want to be a designer? You want to be a grower? You want to be a store operator? Do you want to be? Do you want to build a brand? Like, what do you want to do? I think building a brand is a lot more difficult than people think. You can't just take a fucking T-shirt, put your logo on it, put a bag with your logo on it, and now you got a brand. It's a lot deeper than that. Trust me, I'm aware. And I think that, like, if you go back to YouTube, I think the reason why cookies resonated with people is I documented every step of the process. So if you're going to build something, document it. Because mm. you can go see me pulling the strings to my hoodies, you know, 15 years, 10 years ago, nine years on ago. On YouTube. On YouTube. You can see me making those hoodies, selling that shit. You can see me in the dispensary way long ago, right? Like, I've documented every process of it. So people resonate with it and they know it's real. It's crazy you, you mentioned branding because, like, you have, I feel like you could write a book on how to brand. I want to. Because I'm trying to get a book deal right now. Yeah, because like if you think about the cookies brand, the color, the cookies blue, mm -hmm. just the logo, just everything is so con two logos. You got the font which is on my hand. You got the circle C by. If they ever say cookies can't be used because it's you know attracting children, whatever they might use. You got the colorway. If all else fails, like I just came with a straight identity, bro, and I just I just learned it from watching you know watching the business. I was in the dispensary. I noticed no one really had a real brand. That's like. When you see that blue, you know what time it is. Yeah, what was the thought process behind that color? Because that color, it sticks out. It's, You know, it was the first hoodie I made, bro, for the Yoko video. Like, I just I was like, give me like a like a different blue, like with the blue strings. Like, I just wanted to do something that would pop on camera. When I seen them, I'm like, that's my colorway right there. That's a wrap. How important was that record, Yoko, for you, man? Because that was, a, a, you know, that record also went to radio, right? And it, I think you had a bag going for that record. You had Big Crit, Chris Brown, Wiz. Was that the first record you and Wiz did? Um, so that was 2010, right? I think that that is the first Wiz, Wiz song. Yeah, shit was. It was a big record for me, and I think that like there's a story behind that shit that no one even knows about. What is? Not just like the making of the video was wild. Like when I did that song, I ran into Chris Brown in the studio. Right, he was there. I was smoking bud. His cousin smoked the bud. It was like, oh shit, fuck, would you come eat Brown? Got Brown in the video. Back then, his manager was Tina Davis. She said, all right, well, he, we'll, we'll prove him doing the record, but he cannot do any video. Like, video is not happening. Wow, well, whatever. Um, so I got the record done with Big Crit, Chris Brown. Big Crit made the beat. Shit was tech. I was like, I got to do a video for this. So I was getting at Brown's cousin. He was like, look, if you want to get Chris to come out, you got to bring something dope. He got hella cars. He likes to drive his cars. Like, think of a way you can have him go provide an area for, you know, for him to spin out in his cars or something. Like, come with something, and I'll pitch it to him. I'm like, all right, cool. So I was thinking, like, maybe I can get a race car track. And so I called that uh, NASCAR place in Irvine or, mm -hmm. or whatever the fuck the shit was. And uh, I asked him how much it was, and I said, well, when do you want to do it? I said, tomorrow. He's like, well, no, like, it's not happening. I'm like, okay, well, how much is it? He's like, well, how much you got? I'm like, I got 1500 He laughed at me. He's like, man, like, um, we wouldn't even rent out the parking lot for less than 15 G's. And you want to use the fucking racetrack? I'm sorry, buddy. It's not happening. I'm like, well, can I come see you in person? He's like, if you want to hear no to your face, come through. I'm like, for sure. So I pulled up over there. I met this guy, square dude, square ass motherfucker, old dude. I was like, yo, um, you know, I'm here to, you know, so like, yeah, I don't really know what to tell you, kid. You know, it's not happening. I told you if you want to hear no to your face, no. Okay, can you just do me one favor? He's like, what? I'm like, go to your computer. He's like, all right. I pull it with Khalifa on YouTube and look at his views. Look at his views. Like, all right. So I'm like, go to Chris Brown. Look at his views. Pulls it up. He looks at the views. He's like, if this is about like you think you're gonna give me promo, look outside. I got Coca Cola. I got Pepsi. I got all these places paying me money to be on my wall. I'm like, it's not about that. Let me finish. Go type in burner. Look at my views. Typed in burner. I'm like, you see the difference? I'm like, bro. Like this guy ain't gonna come do this video if I don't think of something and I only have one day. So if you provide me this spot, you can change my life, bro. Straight up. But I just had to hear no in person, bro. So I appreciate you. And the dude was like, you know what? Come here tomorrow. Save your 1500 Bring five for the ambulance. And you could use my racetrack. I appreciate you coming here. I appreciate you telling me why, you, why it was important to you. And I'll let you use the place. I'm like, cool. So I leave. And we show up the next day. This guy's daughter was the biggest fan of Chris Brown ever. I guess he went home and told her. This guy brought down 
the fucking race car drivers that did the video for Otis for Jay Z and Kanye. What? This guy brought out fucking semi fucking eighteen wheel trucks spinning out in the video, right? Straight hundred fifty thousand dollar production value at least, right? Let me do my thing there. Brown pulled up. The energy was crazy. You see them cars yeah. spinning around. Bro, I only spent five hundred dollars for that shit, bro. On everything I love. On everything I love, right? Like that shit was crazy as fuck. And then you see the scene where um I'm driving the eighteen wheeler. Mm -hmm. Bro, I went to Atlanta and I went to every I went to every truck stop where all the truckers were resting and knocked on fucking doors. Okay. And had a thousand dollars and tried to convince the driver to let me drive his shit. They called the cops on me twice. I finally got some cutty Nigerian dude. Was like, whatever, you got a thousand bucks, it's yours. I don't even know how to drive. People don't even know this. I don't even you don't know how to drive. I don't drive a fucking car. <laughs> oh, you don't drive? No, I drive a boat. I don't drive no fucking car. So I was let alone there. a fucking uh, semi. The guy was laying on the ground with his foot on the fucking gas, holding the pedal. I'm sitting there riding on the fucking freeway, bro. Fucking riding this shit, rapping, and the guy's sweating, dude. Like, oh my god, sir, we're done, we're done. I'm like, nah, 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 one more scene, one more scene. So that video was hella crazy to me. It's hella important to me. Now, Atlantic Records put a cease and assist on it for whatever reason, which makes no sense to me. So it's not available anymore. But it was big, bro. I didn't that that that's crazy. It's not on YouTube. Nah, it is, but it's not the one I put up with all the millions of views. Someone stuff. like ripped it and put it on their own channel or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. That was was that and that was prior to you being officially Taylor Gang, correct? Well, it got it got pulled it got pulled when I when I was with Taylor Gang because some dude um, I'm gonna say his name some dude took the song and tried to do some licensing deal with someone in fucking Europe and the Atlanta got pissed and fucking pulled it, but you know whatever. Yeah, I was gonna ask you like you know the era of Burner and Taylor Gang like was a hell of a run like um, uh, you know obviously you and Wiz are always fam you know what I'm saying but like what. I guess what did having that cosign for you do for you as a rapper? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just texted Wiz this morning and thanked him, bro. I woke up this morning and I was just like, bro, I love you because when I met you, when I met Wiz, my mom had just died from cancer, right? So I was in a dark place. I was trying to get away from the street shit because I was really like, I was really fucking with that shit, bro, hard. Like people don't even know and I don't really care. You talk about it a lot in your raps. Yeah, so you know, just use your imagination when you hear that, but. At that time, I was trying to figure out a way because when my mom died, I was like, well, someone's got to be here for my daughter if I go away. Who is that going to be? Well, my mom's gone now, so shit, it's me now. So I got to walk away from all that shit. And when I met Wiz, I was able to meet him and Taylor Gang and see the the the, more, the morale of the crew and see the tour bus. And it took me on tour. I got to see what it looked like to go state to state and perform. It made me step on my performance gang. Mm -hmm. They brought me in. And and they embrace you know the the side of my life that I love most is music. So I, was, I just text Wiz this morning. I'm like, I love you, bro. Thank you, because when I met you, you gave me a spark I needed to keep making music, which is my passion. Because other than that, I might have just went dark in the in the street shit. I might not be here right now. So yeah, I mean, without getting into too many details, like, was there ever a point in time where like the street shit almost ended up costing you your freedom? Yeah, yeah, not big time. Um, I think that a lot of that shit will be told in. Um, in this series I'm doing right now, I just announced a partnership with the creator of Snowfall, uh, the writer director from Den of Thieves, and the producer of Game of Thrones. We're doing a we're doing a scripted uh, crime series about all about pack shipping in Northern California's role in the weed game, and so a lot of them stories will be. It's based on true events, so a lot of them stories will be in there. But yeah, definitely did, bro. Yeah, sure. it's crazy because if you think of like, and obviously like, like you're you know Northern California was kind of like the hub for everyone to go out there get their plug, and then send packs to the midwest to the south to just every it when was it comes to that granddaddy purple and that og and that bubble kush and like just you know even with the cookies and gelato i mean we, we norcal really changed the game especially look at like what humble county did before people knew what green greenhouse or outdoor was i mean there's big margins my boy it was oh especially like, on the outdoor shit yeah it was almost like coke money bro like because if you think about like uh you know if you have like some great light depth or some great green gr greenhouse that's on the east coast is loud at a certain point in time before people knew what greenhouse was i was dog walking people bro margin game insane bro like whew. 
It was a nice time, and the game got changed. But yeah, it's different now. The margins have shrunk. There was a period where people from the south didn't know the difference between indoor and outdoor, let alone indoor and greenhouse. They started figuring out outdoor because obviously it looks way different, smells way yeah, different. Yeah. But the good depths and the good greenhouse would be so good. Sometimes I'd pass. They couldn't tell. Hands. Yeah. <laughs> That's still going on. Uh, yeah, not. But really. not. But not kind to of. the same. I'm sure in your heyday it, it was man forty eight hundred for a pound of greenhouse back what? in the day. Boy, it was big. Yo, it's crazy because you mentioned humble. I just watched this. Uh, I, me and my wife watched this documentary on Hulu. Um, Murder it's, Mountain? No, it's it's a, it's it's oh, the Bigfoot one, the Sasquatch. Yeah, Sasquatch. Shit. Yeah. yeah, I forget what, what it's called. Finding Sasquatch, I think. Yeah, that shit is crazy up there. There's a lot of untold stories, and that's what my whole goal is with that series is to tell Northern California's you know story. Bro. Did you ever get like into that world up in Humboldt County? And uh, absolutely, because that world is crazy, man. Like, there's people absolutely. who go up there and don't come back down. Yeah, not nah, you know Humboldt's um, Humboldt's a beautiful place. There's great people up there. There's a dark side to everywhere you go, but. Humboldt's an incredible. It's like they almost place. there's. It's almost like its own laws up there, low key. Like, well, you get in the hills, it's a whole nother story. You know, I can't wait to. T- that's why I've been waiting though, because a lot of my stories are coming out in the series. There's been some crazy. Give shit me, a, give me one crazy story that that you could give us. Just, just, just give me one, bro. Give me one. Uh, well, as a trailer for the series. Well, one story was. Uh, I was up there with the buyer, and we went to uh to go buy like maybe like a hundred OGs or something like that. And we drove up to like a mountain. So there's a gate on the bottom of the hill. And my dude came down, grabbed the bread, was like, I'll be right back. Cool. So I'm sitting there with this buyer. And he drives up this hill. And we're chilling. It's kind of a hot day. And time just keeps going by. He's not coming back down. I'm just like, damn, I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, damn, what's up? Go to my phone, no service. I'm like, fuck. I'm a little nervous. And the dude's chain smoking cigarettes. I'm with the buyer. He's chain smoking cigarettes. He's like, yo, go up there. I'm like, I'm not fucking going up there, bro. What are you fucking talking about? He's like, go up there, bro. You gave my money to this dude? Go up there. I'm like, man, I don't know what's up there. I don't know how far it is. He's like, you're going to go up there, bro. He's like, it's been about 45 minutes to do say. I'll be right back. Go up there. I'm like, I'm not going up there. Dude pulls out a gun, cocks it back. He's like, Brian, I ain't trying to go there, bro, but you need to go up there. I'm like, fuck, dude. All right. Hop over the little shady fence, start walking. I walk for like 10 minutes, bro, and I'm looking up this road. It's just not stopping. I'm like, Dripping sweat, I come back down like, bro. I don't even see an end to this trail. I, I'm not gonna go. I, I I walked for ten minutes, bro. I'm fucking sweating like fuck. It's hot as fuck. I don't know what to tell you. He's like, that motherfucker played us. That motherfucker walked, drove up the hill with my money and drove down and left. He's like, he played us. You you fucking robbed me. He's holding his gun. I'm like, bro, I did not rob you. Starts honking his horn, honking his horn. Starts tripping. I'm like, bro, just breathe. We're gonna figure it out. It's all good. He's like, it's all good. It's all good, bro. It's all good. He's looking at me crazy, honking his horn. I'm like, this motherfucker's about to shoot me. For sure, I'm about to get shot. And then all of a sudden, my boy comes down that fucking hill. I'm looking at this dude, and he's like, my bad, bro. I had to trim up a few more to make it even 100. I'm like, motherfucker, dude. I started walking up that hill trying to find you. He's like, oh, dude, it's like a mile and a half fucking drive. You wouldn't have fucking, you wouldn't have made it up the hill. Like, maybe, maybe if you would have walked forever, you know? And I was like, damn, god damn, bro. And the crazy thing about that story was I took my little I took my little piece, you know what I mean? My yeah. boy took my little issue from the side when he went up the hill. He gave me my bag. Mm-hmm. I gave it to a little pretty bitch to go ahead and dip off. I hopped in I hopped in a separate car to leave. I was smoking a joint and we're driving. And the dude was so stressed out, bro. I literally, I cannot make this shit up. We're leaving Humboldt County. There's like a little area by um what's that place called? Uh right when you get into Mendo. Um but we're, we're pulling off, and this dude's pulled over, bro. We pass him. I'm sitting there smoking. And I thought to get paranoid for a second, but I don't even have anything in the car. But the weed, I just took a couple. The chick had all my little cut, whatever I made. She was already long gone. But they had this fool pulled over, dude. He had a bad day. He had a very bad day. And he day. had everything on him. He had a 100-pack on him, yeah. And they pulled him over. Yeah. Did they end up, he had a bad day. I never talked to him again, brother. I just, wow, ghosts. Well, it's crazy. It's like that's what well, people don't know. Like in the weed game, like a lot of like if middleman and shit is a great. It's a great little hustle. It was good for me, you know, back then. But it just came with it came with a lot of stress, and you know, I think what happened to dude, man, like he just he was from out of town. He was anxious. He just got profiled leaving that place, and 
I don't think they care about the hundred pack. I don't think they took him to jail. They was looking for money. Them cops out there want money sometimes, bro. Just to I mean? shake you down because they, they know what they know what shit. you're doing. They probably took your shit. You know what I mean? So, yeah, man. Like, the game is not pretty, bro. How much money did the guy go up the hill with? Hundred pack. I mean, fuck. I don't remember what the prices were back then, bro. Hundred pack OG. I gave him like a like forty. Like forty two hundred, forty forty five hundred each back then. You know what I mean? That's a lot of bread. It's a lot of bread. Yeah, yeah. That's that's that's. that's he was gonna shoot my ass, bro. I seen in his eyes. Yeah, sure, sure. he's gonna shoot me. And then the guy comes down the mountain. Motherfucker, bro. Hippie motherfucker, bro. <laughs> hella cool, hella calm, collective. We're sitting there dripping sweat. It's hot up there, bro. It's a hot day. Hey, what up, man? We gotta interrupt the interview real quick to tell you about our family at Odd Socks. Now, when I be riding for Odd Socks so hard, man, it's because I really love the product. They got the most comfortable socks in the fucking world. I got a pair of Odd Socks basics on right now. Go get those. They got the socks, WWE joints. You know what I'm saying? Shout to the Undertaker, Pepsi, motherfucking, really whatever you need. Some weed socks, Nickelodeon, but really, they got the draws now, ladies and gentlemen. I'm holding a pair of Tapatio underwear right now. You want some Pop-Tarts on your dick? Pop-Tart draws. And these motherfuckers are so comfortable. Like, man. So listen, you got to go to oddsocksofficial.com and use the uh, promo code, the discount code BOOTLEGKEV at oddsocksofficial.com. You'll save 20% off underwear, the most comfortable socks in the world. Crazy licenses. Not only they got the WWE, they got the Scarface, they got the Street Fighter, they got the Nickelodeon, they got it all. So make sure you hit that website, oddsocksofficial.com. Save 20% off with the promo code Bootleg Kev. All right? Go do that. Shout out to Odd Socks. Let's get back to the interview. As far as like, um, you know, during that period, I feel like it was kind of like a golden era of like a, a certain moment in the weed game. Like, any of your peers in that game also kind of level up with you at the same time and, 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 and are also kind of doing their thing? Yeah, a yeah, good amount of people. I love to see people from the, the original market and, and, you know, the new market right now, like actually in the legalization market. So shout out to everyone that's like, a lot of people think that I have beef with people or people I beef with me. I think it's like a, it's a very small community. It's a big business, but a very small community. And I think that everyone that's killing, killing it right now, I salute them. I congratulate them. They made it past like a very weird, gray, dangerous area, and now they're in like a new area, but era. But I think this is like timeless, and it's history, and being a part of history is tight. Do you ever find it like frustrating that you can't be? You know, I, I've talked to certain artists, uh, some from your hometown, that are kind of like nonchalantly feel like there's some hate or some weirdo shit towards you. Um, is it hard to be burner and like not being like, like you can't be everything to everybody. Right. And, and especially when it comes to like that shit, like, is it, is it like kind of like, cause you keep a small circle around you. My bubble is super small. It's super yeah. tight. It's super yeah. small. It's been that way for a long time. Like, is that on purpose because of that kind of shit? Cause yeah. everybody wants access to you, bro. Yeah. You know, access is denied right now, bro. Like, Limited access for sure because energy is everything. Time is everything. Life is short. You got to enjoy this shit while you can. You know what I mean? You never know what could happen, whether it be cancer or fucking COVID or fucking get hit by a car. So I keep my circle tight. Do people Are people mad about it? Maybe. I just don't give a fuck. Like, there's only one opinion I care about. It's my daughter's. You know what I mean? And my wife's. And the, the, I really focus on my daughter's opinion. I really care what she thinks about me. Anyone else? Fuck them. Straight up. I ain't worried about it. Are you uh, tapping with? I know you got caps, which is like more of like a mushroom. Yeah, but but are you gonna eventually with the legalization of shrooms? Hell yeah, that's why we set it up already. Like we're doing what we can do legally, but I mean, a lot of my partners on the cannabis side are mushroom enthusiasts, and they know a lot about mushrooms, and they're fired up on it. And so we're just trying to make sure we're in position for when it comes. We're gonna that's a whole other side of the business. Yeah, sure. I feel like that's like the future, low key. Yeah, it is. I just saw Money Man post some shit on Twitter about shrooms. Like he's like, "Yo, Perks and Zans are dead. Rappers, man, if you ain't doing I, shrooms." If anyone's listening to this, man, like pills, coke, all this shit's super dangerous, man. Like the fentanyl problem right now is real. I feel like there's a reason why there's a lot of fentanyl out here in the streets. And I think that people are purposely flooding America with fentanyl for people to harm themselves. Put the fucking lean down. That's just disgusting. I can't believe people are still sipping lean every Did day. Did you ever go through an era with lean? Fuck no. 
Look at my I'm, my eyes are clear as broad daylight yeah. right now. I'm I'm into the bag right now. You know what I mean? I smoke bud and that's it. But um, you know, lean is all bad, bro. I'm seeing people fucking their whole lives are fucking ruined from this shit. They don't even understand, bro. Yeah, no, nah, it's 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 crazy because like you said, the fentanyl shit. I feel like fentanyl is like it's like low key as big of an epidemic as COVID. Just people ain't talking about it like that. Because it's out there, you don't know what you're getting and how, how pure it is. And fentanyl is killing a lot of people. There was I don't know if you saw like in Venice, there was like a house with like four comedians. They left the comedy show, yep. and three yeah, out of four died doing coke. But it was, it was cut with fentanyl. You can't push it in your body right now if you don't know where it's coming from. You know what I mean? Alternative plant medicine, man. Stick with the weed. Stick with the shrooms. Stick with, you know, just stick with shit that's natural. Don't don't touch that shit. Yeah, and for people who don't know, too, like, weed, like, you know, because a lot of the issue with getting off that shit is the withdrawals and shit, but you fucking dab away those withdrawals. <laughs> straight up. Like, straight up, man. Put the drugs down, man. Put the, put the drugs down. Uh, you're You have a lot of interest in the alien shit. Mm-hmm. We did some shit on Clubhouse. We had like a little alien room on Clubhouse in the pandemic. But like, you also kind of have you know you you got some conspiracies that you're tapped in with. But what you know, I, I I think that like with the Obama admitting UFOs are real, I just feel like because the world's so crazy right now because of Trump, because of COVID, because all this wild shit, they're like throwing shit out right now because they know it's not going to be the main story. They have to just cover their tracks. They're letting it come out and just get you know overwhelmed with other shit. Yeah, because I feel like I feel like they're getting they're getting everyone ready for some shit low key. I mean, if we think that our government hasn't been to another planet yet, we're probably pretty crazy. If you ever go outside at night and just look up look up there, and if you're in a clear area, like when I was in Montana, I would go on my boat at nighttime, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, float out to Mill Lake with no lights, and just lay there, and you see all these fucking stars and planets. You don't think there's some other shit up there? You're fucking lost. There's hell other shit up there, and I think the I think Earth is just being burnt out. It's overpopulated. There's a lot of weird shit going on. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of control issues, and people want to be in power. Other countries want to be in power. I definitely feel like there's other other planets out there that we've been to or that we can go to, and that's why you see Bezos. I was going to say, that's why you I think these, these you see these billionaires trying to, they're, trying to they're going to be the first people there. to leave. Because I, I honestly feel like the government's suppressed how easy it really might be to get up there, right? Like, they're just telling you, it's not possible. You got to get this big rock and do this and that. How the fuck do we know that? You look at you look at shit and they say it's this far. It takes, that might all, might all be some bullshit. You yeah. might be able to get in something and just get up. So, I don't know, but I definitely know there's more people, uh, there's more... There's more species out there than just us. We're not we're not like the dominant species. We we've, we've been put here by something else. Our body is designed like a fucking computer. DNA is designed like a fucking computer. It's not. We didn't we didn't just germs didn't just fucking calculate and design us like we were designed on purpose. So that's my thoughts. Do you um have you ever had a UFO experience where you seen something? Yeah. Yeah, I had a, a in Vegas. I was in Vegas. R- randomly at Molly Mall's house. <laughs> uh, shout out to Molly Mall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, legendary home. Yeah, a uh, lot of lot of great stuff happened over there. But yeah, no, it's it's crazy because when I was growing up, uh, my mom's uncle was like an OG at NASA, OG at NASA. So she went to Maryland to visit uh, her her aunt and her aunt's husband who wor- worked at NASA at the time. His name was Doc, and uh, my mom asked him if aliens are real, and he said that he couldn't tell her. But if people knew what was in the ocean, a lot of people would want to kill themselves. Yeah, nah. Dude, I mean, that just stuck with me. Like one the of my, ocean's one a spooky of my best place. friends when I was growing up, um, his grandpa was the super, super decorated war veteran, and like very straight edge, very square, like super, like just legit. And when he was dying, he told my best friend, "Man, just I had to keep this to, to my deathbed, but." There's definitely aliens out there. I've definitely seen things, and you should know we're not alone. And I just wanted to share that with you, and that shit stuck with me too. But you just got to be realistic, man. There's no way we're the only people out here. And I've been even thinking, like, I've been really reading on lately, like, life after death. Like, maybe this is just one big audition for, like, what happens next. Like, I look at my dog sometimes, like, this motherfucker's been here before. Like, he's he was He's been here before, and I start geeking out on that, and I really... I'm really into like what happens when you die type shit right now. Are you like a would would you consider yourself religious? Nah. 
because I'm not I'm not at all either. I, I I'm borderline I, atheist. I'm borderline. I don't know. I, I, I don't trouble, know. I get in trouble a lot when people ask me about religion, but I'll be straightforward. I believe that we were put here by something. If you look at religion, right? Every single religion, whether it be whatever country, whatever religion it is, they all say that someone came from above, mm-hmm. came down, taught them, and went back up. No fucking brainer. Yeah, I've always kind of been. A lot of that shit is man made. They all got the same themes for the most part. Some are a little I bit mean, more crazy. I crazier. just feel like they all experienced the same thing. Someone came from above, taught them, and went back up. What does that mean? Mm. Where are I they mean, going? even like the hieroglyphics. There's some wild hieroglyphics where it's like motherfuckers were bird, humans, and all kinds of shit. So I, I like to get high, bro. When my day ends, I have like an 18 hour, 19 hour work day, whatever the fuck it is. I get home for the last few hours of my day. I just get high and I Google as much as I can. You just did you dive, you dive down some YouTube rabbit holes? Big time, especially in the last two years. Yeah, because you've had time. I got time. I got time, cuz. But besides smoking and uh and you know being a entre- you know fucking entrepreneur fucking boss uh what are you, what are your you know family life aside what are your like you know what's a good day for you hobby wise like if you had to wake up and just do whatever you wanted to do you know what are your hobbies man? Oh, shit, hobbies right now is just the film stuff, which is still work like. Um, I did a comedy with Ed Bassmaster. Shout out to homie Ed. Um, we just freestyled that. And we're about to put that out soon. I got a movie called Splash City, all about uh, the Bippin' in the Bay Area. I really want to bring to life like Northern California crime stories. And like just Northern California is untapped. Like if you really look at a lot of crime films or movies in general based on L.A. Well, especially York, on, a com- Chicago, on a commercial worldwide level. Yeah, there's nothing out the bay. And I feel like that's my job. Right. So. My hobby now is just developing content, uh, barrier based, like, and it's fucked up because it's not really a hobby. I guess it's like work, but that's what I like to do. Yeah. So the show that you're developing with uh, the Snowfall people, mm-hmm. that's like a big deal. It's a really big deal. That's like, that's not like some like independent like rap shit. Like. Nah, but see the thing is like I also understand that that we're gonna raise like seventy to eighty million to do that project, and it's gonna take time. So in between that, while developing that, I'm trying to knock out all the shit. Learn like, the game. Yeah, I'm trying to do like an independent like the Splash City. It's like me and um, a group called uh, Four Ways Entertainment. They just want to they want a Latin film festival for the movie called Slipping in the Darkness. I just I appreciate their hustle, their work ethic. I locked in with them. I'm like, come to the Bay. Let me write this movie. Let me direct it with you. You guys execute it. We'll edit it together, and I'll put it out. So that that way, while I'm developing this series, people will start getting a sense of my style when it comes to film shit. Everyone's got their own style. You got Scorsese. You got you know Spike Lee. You got all these guys. Shit, Rob Zombie he was an artist. He got his own style. Got his own style. Yeah. My style is gritty. It's real gritty. I see a lot of these crime series on TV right now. A lot of them are a little too pretty for me. They're too pretty. They're too produced. Like, let's bring some edgy shit back. Like, Menace to Society was so sick, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Menace, yeah, like, raw as fuck. Like, I mean, we need that shit back, bro. Some of this shit's too pretty, bro. Like, I think the last show that really did that for me was The Wire. The Wire was great. I think the last show that did it for me was Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad was raw as fuck, yeah. It was good. It was produced, but it was good. It felt real. That's real. Do you, do you watch Better Call Saul? Just nah, been on. I haven't I'm dived in yet. Solid. Solid. But a perfect day for me would be wake up at 6 a.m., make my green juice or drink a green juice, work out, chill with the dogs, play on my phone till my shit starts ringing, get some work done, go to my daughter's volleyball game, watch her, make some dinner for the kids, you know, watch a good couple crime movies and relax. Like, that'd be my perfect day. Not these hectic days where it's just back-to-back calls, like, until I go to bed. Those days hurt. Like, Those days suck. They drain yeah, you. Yeah, bro. The other day I had a day, bro. Like I started first call at 6.30 a.m. I got off at 11 p.m. And I just felt like, what the fuck am I doing, bro? You know, my spread then is there too much going on. I just had to breathe and didn't get a chance to work out. Didn't get a chance to chill with the fam. But at the end of the day, man, is what it is. We're blessed. You're going to have those kind of days, man. Yeah. You know, you're kind of, you got like a, you're inside man. Like you probably know more than most people. Is there like, like, what do you think the realistic, uh, Chances are of weed coming off the federal federal drug list. I should I want to say that it's going to happen because it'd be a great day for me, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. You don't think it's going to happen because uh, you think it, it, I mean, because at the end of the day, if New York is finally on, you think it's just going to have to be a state by state thing. It's going to be gray area 
for a long time. I think the feds and the government want to figure out how to milk every single part of the business. And until they figure that out, they're not going to do it. But Sleepy Joe ain't going to let that shit happen, bro. That boy's tired as hell. He don't, he's turning this shit into China 2.0 right now. I'm not going to lie. I voted for Joe Biden. Yeah. But, man. I didn't vote this time. It was, it was less of two evils for me. It was damned if you do, damned if you don't. But damn, Sleepy Joe is fucking, fucking shit up right now. <laughs> the entire bastard's on the warpath. But you know, it is what it is. And I, I don't see his administration legalizing weed in. And, and what's crazy is... They promised it. He, They promised it. That's what their whole market... That's, they was talking about that shit and they ain't doing nothing. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's bad, man. I don't know. I, you know what? Like you said, damned if you do, damned if you Give don't. Give that boy a cup of coffee, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. Have you guys ever like done any like, you know, shit when we think of uh cigarette companies do lobbyist shit? Have you guys ever done some lobbyist shit? No. Nah. I don't trust none of that shit. Yeah. I'm gonna lobby myself. Shit. Is it weird though? Cause now all these corporate motherfuckers are like coming into the weed game, trying to buy out these companies and and I feel like kind of fucking it up low key. Like I mean, I've talked to a bunch of them. I'm not doing that. If I ever exit, bro, if I ever exit, if there's ever a liquidity event for me, they understand there's like Major, 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 major protection of the brand involved. Like, no one's down to do that. I, my goal is to pass this shit to my daughter, to be honest with you. I tease her all the time. You're about to be a little CEO. You better learn a game. You and understand? she already has a clothing line. Yeah, that's why I did that. She understands. That's big, man. And I never, you know, I don't really promote her shit like that because I'm making her and her, make her figure out. They got to figure it out. How's it doing? It does cool. It could do a lot better, but and I, I'm sure if I post it every day and every drop, it'd probably do way better, but I want her to learn the struggles. I don't want to just give her everything. She's got to work for it. But, like, me and her bond by, like, designs and, like, we could flip a jacket like this or you could do like this or you can... And she's really proud of her shit and she wears it to school and I couldn't be more proud of her, but I wanted to learn that shit hands-on, you know? How was um, settling down for you? Because, you know, you you had your days. I was a wild boy. You was a wild boy. I was a wild, was a wild, wild boy. boy. I was a wild boy. Settling down for me was good. Yeah, because I feel like, you know, at the, at, at, you know, for me too, like I was a wild boy for sure. I was wild. And you don't even know I was wild. But you know what though? Like it feels so much better not having to deal with that shit. Like you know how it should be. Multiple girls and phones and hiding and this. I can't even think about doing that right now. Yeah, I think too like once you've done everything. You, it's like man you like there's almost only so much of, the, of of that shit you could do i did it all i was a bartender before any of this shit. you gotta remember that mm -hmm. when i was working at the hemp center i was a bartender at 18 you have to understand i did it all i did it all right it was amazing i was young my hair was slicked back i was skinny it was incredible but i think that settling down leveled up my business yeah for sure like it it took me from like hood rich to in a great place Straight up. Yeah, I feel like since I got married to my wife, everything is improved. Shout out to our wives. Shout, Shout out to, to the wives. wife. Because if I wasn't if I wasn't able to go to like when I'm here working or if I'm traveling, if I didn't know that my household was good and my daughter was straight when she's at my house, because my daughter's been at the house with my wife now um, for like five days and she hasn't even went back to her mom's house, you know. So it's it's perfect because I know I have a solid household and that shit does numbers for your mental, mental state. Yeah, when you're gone, and you know everything's handled. Yeah, yeah. Now same thing with my wife. I'm like, yo, I, I could be at, in Miami for a whole week and I know I don't got to worry about it. I nothing. get yelled at for not cleaning now and now, you know, here and there. But at the end of the day, settling down made me like a very successful business guy. I see a lot of my friends caught up with hella girls and shit. That shit's ass backwards. If you want to get to the bag, have a wife. Hey, that's a bar. If you want to get to the bag, have a wife. Straight up. And happy wife, happy life. Straight fucking facts. <laughs> fucking facts. Yes. Have you uh, considered, I know you, uh, you you mentioned Montana earlier, but have you considered like s switching your primary residency out of California? Yeah, but I just don't know where I would go. Um, you know, a lot of people in my position, because you have to think like, if I sold my business with the new Biden administration's laws, like, I probably have to give 68%, I think it's 68% federal. Something crazy. I don't know. Like, bro, I, I, I don't I would, know. I don't want to speak on it because like, I don't know. I would end up keeping like 15% of my business profits, right? Like, So I don't know. I can't do Miami. Miami's too humid. Humid. Vegas is kind of like too dry for me. Um, Vegas are, is a vibe, though. Those are the two like places where you can No could state really, tax. Yeah, you could really save money. And, and if you really wanted to be a savage, you can go to Puerto Rico and no federal tax. That's fucking wild. So you can get a $100 million check, go to Puerto Rico, live there for three years, and all that money's yours. I think that's uh, 
Logan Paul just relocated to Puerto Rico. Did, I'm sure what, he fucking did. I, but the way I look at it, it's like this, bro. I just want to be where I want to be. I'm not going to go hide somewhere for X amount of years to say, I just. Money comes Vegas ain't bad. You know, I used to live in Vegas. I know Vegas, Vegas is cool. It's hot, though, bro. It's dry. I mean, you lived in Arizona. I did. I don't want to go back. Uh, yeah, it's too hot. It is so hot. I'm a cool player, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how, how many years were you in AZ? I think on and off for like five years. And that was because your mom was out there? Yeah, my dad was supposed to open a restaurant out there, so and there was cheap housing, and so we wanted to go move over there, and then my pops got caught up with some shit, cheating and whatnot. So he stayed in California, my mom stayed there, and I just bounced back and forth. And uh, what part of, of AZ were you in? Chandler. Oh, you were in the Chandler. People don't know, man. Chandler ain't, ain't nothing sweet. Certain parts of Chandler ain't nothing sweet. Man, come on, Chandler. Arizona's really a wild place. It is. People don't believe me. I'm like, listen, guys, Arizona's different. Everyone has a gun. <laughs> I mean, I was selling acid in the sixth grade in Arizona. Wow. A bitch put a pinky nail out and had me hit crystal meth in class in seventh grade. In class. In Chandler. I Arizona. thought it was Coke. It was fucking crystal. Arizona's turned up. So you, it was up for two days. So you did meth in seventh grade? <laughs> On accident. You did meth by accident. She was such a pretty bitch. She had long ass curly hair, big ass earrings. Yeah. Jewelry. She was a cartel baby for show. She, she had this long ass nail. She was like, hey, look at this. Take a little bump. I'm like, I'm like oh shit. I started feeling it. I'm like, oh shit, what was that? This shit burned. She's like, that was meth. I'm like, oh fuck. What the fuck? I was on one for two days. I was fucked up, dude. It was fucked up. Did you ever go through like a, you know, obviously outside of just experimenting with drugs, did you ever go through like a time where you were like doing coke yeah, on a regular basis? I was coke for a while. <laughs> yeah. What years were th- was when this? I was bartending, bro. Yeah, because I'm saying I did it all. Dude, when I was eight, eighteen, like eighteen to like twenty, twenty one or twenty three, I was just you were wilding. I was wilding, bro. doing coke, probably doing some ex like, Molly. No Molly, just coke because Friday night was Friday night was hip hop, Saturday night was techno, and then Sunday night was salsa. And all the fucking Cubans and Colombians would come. And they all found out I was only 18, 19. Right. I was fucking all the bitches. Oh, man. They kept giving me bumps, key shots, giving me like eight balls while I was working. It was just part of the culture. And the bartender lifestyle is very shady. It's very dirty lifestyle. Just Coke, 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 liquor. And I was finally, one day, I was like, I can't do this shit no more. I'm over this shit, dude. I almost OD'd at Reggae in the River. That's what it was. Oh, shit. That's why I stopped doing Coke. Reggae in the River, what is that? It's a festival in Northern California. Where it's on the river. It's hot as hell. I was on Coke and Grey Goose, Grey Goose for three days. I turned pale and I dropped. And I woke up at the medics and I'm like, yo, dude, you got to you gotta just chill it out a little bit. And I remember I went home to my chick's house and I did a bump. And my heart started doing the same thing it did when I fainted. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm done. I don't want to die. That was it. It's over. I was about to have a baby too. So it was a wrap. Yeah. Never, never, and that's why I don't drink to this day though. Because, and that's why I don't drink Because when I drink it, The combination of cocaine and alcohol Is, is a, a powerful is a, motherfucker Yeah it's a great one I've never done cocaine But I, I know that the, the people who I know Who I'm still close with That's their thing Is they get drunk and they do coke Yeah Because you could just keep going Yeah But I'm glad I stopped that shit Hell on It's been what uh, Janelle's 14 It's been 15 years since I touched that Or alcohol Wait so you haven't drank in 15 years? I've maybe had like a couple sips or maybe with Wiz I took like one or two shots, but I don't drink, drink. No, nah, hell no. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, you're right. Because I've seen you like at Dre's and like you're just I just drink. there I don't smoking. Drink. Yeah. I don't drink. Yeah, alcohol is like, I'm not an alcoholic, but I understand like, I like, I like the social lubricant of like, you know, if I go out, just having some shots and. I but f- I never I'm dealt gl- with I never dealt with doing coke. I've never. I'm glad I don't drink, man. Like Wiz is the only one that can pressure me to drink because we laugh hella hard. But my version of drinking it's like two or three shots. That's it. Like yo, take some of this gin and lemonade. Yeah, or just some take of this, this McQueen. Gin. Just take this gin straight. But yeah, I don't understand that about Wiz. Is that they like gin is disgusting by itself. God he bless made, it. He made gin cool. He so did straight up Bombay and lemonade. That's oh. a good mixed drink, but by itself, it's like drinking gasoline, bro. Fuck that. It's 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 horrible. Was there ever a point in time where you had an opportunity to maybe do something on the major label side where you just kind of kept it kept it moving? Because I know you know you've been do, you've been doing the distro with Empire since I really feel like since Empire was ever even a thing. Uh, fuck major labels, dude. They never understood me. They never wanted to take the time to understand me. It's probably their biggest mistake because, I mean, they probably would have had a piece of everything I'm doing now. So, I sat down with a couple and they just did not understand me. They never took the time to understand. How early on were you, did you link with Gazi? For 2006. 
2005 or six. Was that when he was rapping? Mm. No, nah, he was at uh, Ingroves. Okay, yeah, yeah. So he left Ingroves, started Empire. And so from the rip, were you just doing distro through his company? No, nah, I was at Ingroves. And one day he told me, yo, I moved your catalog over to my new company. I'm like, what, what the fuck are you talking about, bro? I would like it. Now you're going to get the same check. I'm going to give you a better split. Just trust me. And I was one of his first clients. And yeah, and it's, you know, I always tell people like, Empire is the shit. Check comes every month on the first. I tell some of these major label artists how much I get for iTunes checks, and they're like, what the fuck? Are you serious? Well, they're idiots. They sign all their leverage away. They fucking... A lot of these major artists, they sign too early. I feel bad because when I tell them how much I get from just my Empire check alone, you could see their eyes like, what the fuck? Well, because most artists aren't getting any money. They don't get anything. They're literally... They got to make their advance last because they're not going to ever recoup. You know, uh, we, we did an interview with YG a couple of years, maybe like middle of the pandemic. He, he was like, I've never seen any money off my Def Jam shit. He's one of the dopest guys ever. That's He's the terrible. best. Yeah, it's terrible. And at the time he was like, on oh, some fuck Def Jam shit. But like, it's crazy because that story is happens a lot. If someone's going to give you some money up front, it's probably a bunch of bullshit that comes with it. A I'm thousand glad, percent. I'm glad I did it the way I did yeah, I always tell everybody, man, don't take the, the bigger the advance, you better make it the, the longer you got to make it last. It kept a certain hunger inside me too. I like being the underdog. That's that what's your favorite burner album? Uh, like you just said you're working on your best album yet. I've heard you say that almost every time you put an album out. But what's your favorite ever? Um fuck, dude. They're all they're like journals, dude. I don't know. I mean, I think the White Album, I think Drugstore Cowboy is a good one. I think the White Album was really, really good, too. Um, but the reason why I say this is the best album I've done now is because I got Cosmo producing it. It's my best friend. We work great together. I you guys just did a collab album. Yeah, and I really leveled him up on the way that we're doing the production of the project. I gave him free range. Like, instead of me just being in the studio, like, send me a beat, I'm going to rap. Like, we're just spending 10 days on just producing this thing. Mm. And then I'm going to take that production and come back, you know, on five days, six days from now, and then really just dive into, like, recording. So I like this body of work because we're actually really doing it, like, from scratch. Like yeah, everything. Like from no the rip. samples. I'm not getting sued anymore. There's people playing guitars, people doing vocals. Like, it's really cool. You had, like, a era with um, El Chivo where you were diving a lot into collaborating with a uh, Latin artist. And I know that you had kind of flirted with the idea of maybe doing an album with Dell Records. Yeah. Um, Shout out to Dell. Yeah, I mean... The record is incredible. Shout out to Chris. I, I think I think uh, I was DJing one of your shows. I think oh, it was in Vegas at um, Hard Rock, mm -hmm. and Chris came out and sang. And yeah, um, but that was that, like, what did you learn from kind of dabbling in that side of the game? Because the you know the Latin shit is crazy. I just was in the uh, Latin billboards for a whole week because my artist is Mexican, so we were out there. I just learned it's that a like, different there's world. a whole other world out there. And I think what we did with El Chivo Records, we took hip hop and their traditional like style of making music and combined it and it was like the first of that kind like we flipped the Nas beat dude you know what I mean like we flipped the old Nas record and we did it like that and so I think that no one's really tried it and I kept to what I do I rapped in English he sang in Spanish and it was a great natural combination of music and I mean I would love to sit down with them and do a project with them I'm down to do an album with him for sure and produce everything live and documented. Like, that's the kind of shit that would be fun to me. Yeah, because you were, like, starting to work with a lot of Latin artists. Uh, well, obviously, Ozuna. Guys. I, try, I tried it with La Plaza. I tried it, but, like, it just it's tough, man. Like, it's just, music is tough. Like, people people enjoyed it. And music actually was really good. But my core fan base complained a little bit. So it's, it's tough to dial that in, you know. What was it like um, working with Nipsey on the Wax Room? And, like, what? Best. Rest in peace to Nipsey. I mean, I made the record. I'm going to tell this story. I never really told this story either. I made the record. I hit up Nipsey. Me and Nipsey talked a lot in DM. And Nipsey's the one rapper, one of the only rappers that respected me as a musician. Like He respected my music. Mm. He gave me my props all the time on the music. I talked a lot with him in the DM and, um, you know, text back and forth. And so I hit him. I was like, I got this record. He's like, pull up. I said, hopped in an Uber, pulled up by myself. His studio was hella deep, hella, hella, hella homies. They're all so welcoming to me. We started blazing. He went in the booth. He did his his vocals, killed it. Gave me the session. I went right back to my studio, mixed it, and we were, came time for the video. I came out to L.A. to do the video, and he didn't. He I was blown away. He didn't show up. 
was like, fuck, he faked on me. I was blowing him up. I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. It's cool. And the next day he hit me like, my bad, bro. I was dealing with some shit, like some real shit. But I got you. Send the camera guy to me. I'm going to knock that out for you. I'll take care of it. I'll pay him too. I got you. I'm like, nah, man. You sure? He's like, yeah. He knocked it out, bro. He knocked out his scenes for me. Send it to me. It was it was perfect, bro. Like, I give that guy so much respect on what kind of person he was, what kind of business guy he was. Um, so he showed me a lot of love. Yeah, I think like he he also too like with, you know the way you're kind of showing people there's a, there's a whole another way you could go with this shit. He he did a good job of showing people the same way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, nah. I mean, dude, fuck that guy's the best. I think the last time I talked to him, he told me you did for the word cookies, but Dr. J did for the word chronic. I can't even say cookies without people thinking it's weed. Pops, bro, you really did that shit. That's the last time I talked to him. Yeah, I mean, what was the origin of cookies? Because I always hear different stories, right? That like you were behind that or, the original strain, or your people were yeah, behind no, the we original were. strain. That we were the original shit was called Girl Scout cookies, but we knew we were gonna get sued, so I just called it cookies. I think the first time I ever smoked it was with Two Chains at Molly Mall's house in Vegas in like 2010 or 11. Two Chains, my boy, too. I like Two Chains, man. It's a cool cat. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I don't know if he's doing anything in the weed game, but I feel like he should be. He's a man, bro. Like, I, I, I DM with him a lot, too, just bullshitting. He's cool. I like two chains. Yeah, chains a good dude. Who's, uh, besides, you know, uh, let's, let's take Ross, Wiz, the immediate guys we know you to be really close with. Who would you consider to be, like, a true friend in the rap game that you've encountered? Because we have a lot of accomplices. Mozzie. He's a good friend, bro. We talk about life. We don't we don't really talk about politics or that we talk about life. Kids, business, um, you know, just life, bro. I like Mozzie. Would you do a sequel? Hell yeah. That's I'm, like, I'm working on this shit right now. That'd be crazy. Yeah, I need that. That first one is gonna be hard to top, man. It's gonna be easy. You guys got you got logic on a song with Mozzie. Yeah, exactly. You know what? That song is cracking on Spotify right now. It's it's probably one of Mozzie's number one songs on Spotify. I just found this out. Out of nowhere, it just happened like... No, it is. It's, 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 uh, I, I just was on Mozzie's profile and it was in the top five. Yeah, it just happened like a couple months ago, but yeah, fucking Logic. What, because like for a while there, you were, you were, you were linking with Logic a lot. Um, I, I was trying to do something with him, but you know, he's, he's a busy guy, man. You know, he's, he does Because I know he started smoking and getting, you know. Logic smokes, man. No, I know, but he used to not. Yeah. He used to be a drinker. Yeah. He likes the weed. So you guys were trying to, because I know he pulled up to the uh, cookies on Melrose Grand Opening. Yeah, we were gonna do some man, but I don't think um, I don't think he had the attention to do it. We we're gonna do something together. We we're gonna the do Stony it. Bob shit. Yeah, we we're gonna do it, man. It just never happened. Just didn't end up coming to fruition. Nah, but I love Logic. He's on me. And then, uh, you know, you was it Michael Blanco? You did the uh, podcast with and the Strain. Yeah, Corleone, yeah. Yeah, or that's Michael my, Corleone. I'm yeah, a, yeah, that's my dog. But the, but the weed's called Blanco, right? Yeah, Blanco, yeah. Yeah, so that's... But uh, how'd that relationship start? Because I listened to that podcast. It was a wild-ass podcast. You know, um, man, one of our team members did a design with his mom on it. And he reached out through a mutual army. He was like, don't get it fucked up by my mother's son, dude. Like, you know, you're going to do something and not holler at me? And I was like, oh, shit. Fuck. This dude's a boss. Called him. We just bonded hella right away. We had a lot of things, a lot of mutual friends, and just, just built a friendship from there. Just did some business, and that's my guy. He's a, he's a man. Yeah, no, nah, that was. But you got to bring back Burner's Roundtable, bro. I want to bring it back. I'm working on something right now. I'm working on a deal with it. I just my whole thing was it got to be the right platform. It got to be the right production value. And I need, I need you got to do video. Yeah, because a lot the first one you guys didn't do any video, right? Yeah, it was all audio. Yeah. I want to do. I want to do it. I'm talking to someone right now. I just told him like it got to elevate. It got to complement the level of business I'm doing right now. I don't want to just do it for you know just to do it. Got to be a big. Is it hard? Uh, Cause you you know you hit the road. You do your your yearly shows. Is it hard to to for you to step out and hit that stage with what's going on right now? Like as far as just like getting over that mental blockade that like shit. There's a thousand people in front of me. I don't know if they got COVID or not. Well, we just. I mean, all you can do right now, and yeah, no, nah, it is fucking scary. I mean, all you can do is keep your immune system strong, you know, keep your backstage clean, test everyone that's coming backstage with you, and roll the dice, man. If I got a show in Oklahoma coming up, the motherfuckers told me it was outside, it's indoors. I'm like, God damn it. Mm. I mean, but it is what it is, man. Like, I get high from the crowd, so. What's your, uh, you, you have some crazy fans. Uh, one in particular I remember was a guy in Tucson, Arizona had a portrait of you, a fat dude. He had a portrait of you <laughs> on his fucking belly. I love that guy. Where's you know who I'm talking at, about? Man? Where's that guy? Send that guy his roses, man. That's this guy's guy. got a 
burner portrait on his yeah. belly with the cookies logo underneath of it. Like it's Tupac Thug Life. Yeah. And I was I was DJing the show and I look in the crowd and this guy fucking showing me. His, I was like, oh, this is different. You know what's tight about that shit, bro? What's tight about it is I know deep down side of, you know, God forbid something happens to me, bro, I'm going to live for a long time, bro. Like, and I did that off like staying true to like what I wanted to do. Like, through cookies, through vibes, through the music. Like, I got a place here for a while. So it's tight to see that because that shit ain't going nowhere. Homie's going to have that. Forever. When he's a grandpa and she's going to have that right here. People are like, who is that? Oh, this is this guy. This so, is. You know, it's a good accomplishment, man. Like, people got that shit tattooed all over the world. My logo, this and that. Yeah. It's a fucking compliment. Bro. Um, you, you talk about vibes. Uh, I know you and the guy from Raw Papers went at it um, for a while. What happened there? He's a homie now, dude. It's you and Josh good. worked it out. Yeah, he's a homie now. So what? Because it was it was pretty contentious for a while. You I know, literally, I literally kind of stopped following, dude. And yeah. You know, at the end of the day, bro, um, I think that just like business is emotional. That that category, that rolling paper category, is very small, bro. It's and he's small. had his. He's, he's had his. It's very political. Yeah. And I think that like, I think he expected me to just not. Go do something in that space, and uh, we just recently we started talking again, and I got major. I always say in interviews too, he is the paper Don. He is the one that he he's the boss of the paper game. It doesn't mean that I can't do my thing too. So I think we're in a good position now to where he respects what I'm doing, and I respect him. I always respect him. At who well, you guys was. had a relationship prior to you launching Vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's cool. He, he's a business mogul, bro. At the end of the day, like. I look up to the kind of business he's accomplished. So it's like, I respect him. Now we had a falling out and I reacted the way I did and he reacted the way he did towards me. But I think all that time went past and let bygones be bygones. And it's not like either of you guys lost like respect for each other. Nah, bro. I think he respect, I think that I've leveled up a lot since that falling out and he respects where I'm at now too. You know Has I mean? the paper business been the most challenging thing you've done? Cause it feels like a, a ve- like you said, it's a very like interesting business. I'm sure. At to first, get yeah. At first it was challenging, bro, because there was a lot of roadblocks, you know, was it from him or was it from people, other competitors? I'm sure it was, but now we got this shit in the chokehold as a wrap. Yeah, cause like I see, I see it myself now. Vibes is like everywhere, bro. Like, and we're doing cool products, like the Cali. Like, that's innovative as fuck. Like, the first person to launch like a cylinder style, you know, uh, product where you could just stuff it and blaze it. It's yeah. not a cone. The cone's cool. The cone don't really hit like that. You know what I mean? So I'm, I mean, I'm fired up. We're doing cool things like the Cubano, the Cali. We got a lot of things coming out. Which one is the red one? Is that the Cali? Well, the, the Cali, the, the red, red is just a hemp. So, like, okay. you got hemp is red, rice is blue, and then black is ultra thin, and green is organic hemp. So, we have just different skews. What's next, man? Besides the movies, besides the TV, is there anything else? I want to be a, I want to be a chef, bro. You can cook? I can cook good. So, you want to open a restaurant, or you want to be a chef? I want to first be a chef, like, like an ideal world, cook for you after this interview. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, do some personal chef shit. And then maybe one day open a restaurant. Yeah. What is your, um, if you had to open any kind of restaurant? Latin Fusion, probably. Latin Fusion. Yeah. I like that. So yeah. let's say uh, I'm like, Burn, cook me your best dish. I'm coming over for dinner. Whip some shit up. What are you making? Shit. Probably like a, like a, right now my best dish right now is the lamb chops with the reduced white wine sauce. Some nice crispy lemon potatoes and a nice salad on the side. Super fire. Maybe put over some like, yellow saffron rice or something like that. Your, is your wife a better cook than you? She, she has more plates than me. She has more plates. Yeah. What you make, you can you can throw down, but she got down. she's got more. But it's team. We both learned to cook together, so yeah. So you getting in the food business is what's next for the empire, probably. I think so. Yeah. Hey man, I can see it, bro. Yeah, Bernie Hunter, bro. I was gonna say, how dope is it? Because you were talking about being on Hate Street, like freestyling. How dope is it to have your own shit on on, on that street now? Life goals, bro. Do you feel like San Francisco? Because I, I'm now that I'm working with Empire, I, I go to San Francisco often, at least once a month. I'm there, and you know, I'll talk to guys like uh, like Amen or you know Shabazz, like guys from the Bay, and they're like, "Yo, the energy is kind of out of the city right now." It is. Like what? Like what do you think? Kind of the Bay is right now? Because I'll go there and I'll be like, man, I remember when I was coming here five or six years ago. Like there was like a, it feels like the vibe is kind of missing right now. The Bay Area is a tough place. 
That's the best way I could describe it. It's just tough. Every aspect of life, just tough. It's expensive. It's expensive. It's a lot of, not a lot of people made it from the Bay. People don't trust each other. There's no unity. Like, it's just weird. Yeah, it feels like a very, like, uh, especially now, too, like, you can't even go to a fucking restaurant if you're not vaccinated. It's just you can't, a, you can't even go to a restaurant without getting your windows broken either. So it's like, you know. Oh, yeah, because it's, it's the smash and grab capital. That's why I'm doing the movie Splash City. It's crazy. Ooh. New school New Jersey drive, baby. Is that what the movie's kind of? Yeah, it's all based on that. Yeah, because for people who don't know, San Francisco's the smash and grab capital of the world. It's crazy. Your window gets smashed out if you got anything in your fucking car. Even if you don't, they're just going to pop in windows. They're just going to see what's in there. Yeah. That shit is wild, man. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that shit is crazy. So the new album that you're working on right now, is it going to be coming out before the end of the year? Yeah. What's it called? Do we know? I'm working on that name right now. It's very, the name is very, it's going to take some, I have to get some permission for the name, but just know it's going to be Mafia. I'll just leave it at that. Some Mafia yeah. shit. Yeah, Mafia. Is it some movie shit? Nah, but it's tight, bro. Trust me. It's next level, dude. It's going to be sick. I'll tell you offline. The, you always are so good at your artwork, too. This one's going to be fucking crazy. Yeah, I, I feel like you've had the same dude doing your covers from the yeah, jump. Photo Doctor. Champ. Kills it. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like uh, everything's consistent except for, I want to say, the one where you had the guy do the weed. Was that the yeah, Big yeah, Pescado? Yeah. yeah uh, Big Pescado. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, was that it? Yeah. yeah, yeah Big it's so crazy how you don't even know because you have like 50 million albums. Nah, I have no fucking clue anymore, Miles. Well, listen, man. Uh, I can't wait to hear the new music. Right on, brother. And Appreciate you having me, man. Of course, bro. Uh, when you hit me, I was like, we got to do it for sure. Yeah. Um, go go get you some cookies. Yeah, man. Go go get your lungs right, man. Get your lungs right. Get your gear right. Smoke some vibes. Is Zoomy's the biggest like retailer that holds cookies right now? Um, Probably the biggest chain store, yeah. It's so crazy, man. I just, I got fucking the new shit y'all are dropping, of luggage, fucking, I got, it's not gonna stop. I bought the cookie slides and my puppy fucked them up. Shout out to my new French bulldog, fucked up my red ones. Don't worry, we got another box coming for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, gotcha. man, I appreciate you, Burn. Right and, on, brother. And um, I, I am proud of you, bro. Right on, man. I'm yeah. gonna go do what I do. I'm gonna go get to work, man. Let's go. Yeah. Burner, Bootleg Cat Podcast. Salute. Boom. <laughs>